McGraw-Hill Education Programs, SRA Flex Literacy, and McGraw-Hill Reading Wonders. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Doug. Thank you, and welcome, everyone. Um, I see on the screen right now you'll have my website address, fisherandfry.com. That is the, uh, way to, the best way to contact me and to find the resources that uh, Nancy and I put up there. We hope that's useful for you. Today we're going to zero in on close reading in greater detail, but specifically close reading of complex text. There really is no reason to uh, closely read texts that aren't very complex. That's not an instructional routine that would work or that would really matter for students. My goal today is that as we finish our time together, that um, you will have a strong sense of what are the essential components of close reading. When someone says close reading, what do they really mean by that? What are those essential components um, of complex text? And I want to make sure we talk about that close reading requires the collaborative conversation, that, that students are engaged in student-to-student -student interaction with one another in the presence of their peers talking about these complex texts as they go deeper and deeper and deeper. And part of that is, what do we do after the close reading? One, of, one task of which is writing from the source itself. And we want to make connections between the close reading procedures and some of the other standards, like collaborative conversations and writing from sources. Um, if you have questions, please type them in the question panel. I think um, the other Doug told you that already. Um, and if we don't get to them, we'll do some follow-up email with you. Here is the standard that we're all thinking about, talking about, wondering about, discussing. And the nickname of this standard is the Close Reading Standard. That's how it's referred to a lot. I would like to point out the standard doesn't actually say close reading. It says to read closely. To read closely is the habit we're trying to develop long term over time with our students. And we're using a process called close reading to get them to do this. I would also like to point out the standard has a lot more to say uh, than just close reading. You know, it talks about the, what does the text say explicitly and making logical information inferences from the text. Citing evidence, which is big. I mean, we don't see a lot of that right now in most classrooms the press for evidence even when students have the right answer or the expected answer. And then learning to draw conclusions from the text itself. And, and these, are, these are some hard things. This is, a, this is a pretty complex standard and can be the focus of PD for months and months and months to get really, really good at just this one standard. When I think about the transition to the Common Core, and some people are further along in this and some people are not quite so far along on this, this standard itself um, is one of the five I would recommend as the transition standards uh, to Common Core. I think reading standard one is really important in shifting instruction. I think reading standard 10 is also important in shifting instruction because we want kids reading complex text. I think the speaking and listening standard one, the collaborative conversation is important. The writing standard one, arguments and opinions, and then language standard six around academic vocabulary, demand specific, and general academic words. Those five have allowed us in San Diego to get a lot of traction on moving forward with Common Core. We're going to talk about a couple of those today, including the one you see up right now is around reading closely. And close reading starts with text selection. You've got to have a text that's worth it, that's worthy, that deserves and requires a closer inspection of the text. The Common Core gave us a three-part model. I assume many of you already know this. Um, I think this is cause for celebration uh, in the K-12 system, that we recognize that text can be analyzed in a bunch of different ways. Um, we can look at the quantitative measures of a text and look at how the syllables and the sentence length and the vocabulary selected, how that contributes to the complexity <coughs> of the text. We can look at the qualitative measures of the text, and we can look at the task and who the reader is. And a couple of comments about that. I think in the recent past, most elementary classrooms have relied on quantitative measures. Been a, there's been a lot of attention on leveling libraries and, and the way that people you know, level them, often with those colored dots on the book, is simply and only quantitatively. And I think Common Core is helping us remind elementary folks 
there are other ways to think about text complexity besides the lexile or the atos or the source rater, the tools that are there. Um, I think that's an important consideration. In middle schools and high schools, we see mm, this doesn't really matter at all to a lot of people. A lot of teachers choose their favorite text irrespective of whether or not they're complex. So we still have um, a ways to go on this, but I think we're learning a lot about how to think about which text to select. The way they're presented in the standard is quantitative, qualitative, and task. People have argued about that over the last year. People are talking about you should start with the task first because the task will help you select the text. People have had lots of conversations. What I really appreciate is that we're having this conversation of broader ways to think about the text complexity. I put this graph in. Nancy and I made this a few months ago, about six months ago or so, because we have never seen this kind of comparison. We've seen a table, but not this visual comparison of the former and the now common core aligned lexile ranges. And we thought it was an interesting way to look at where, um, where the, the demands were increased, where the push really is. Um, and you, people talk about things you know, like the 1010 over there that used to be the upper band of eighth grade is now this the upper band of this grade. And so people are talking about those kinds of increases in complexity. The one I hear a lot is 960 used to start ninth grade, and 960 is now the upper band of the fifth grade and the lower band of sixth grade. And yeah, there, you can definitely see that. We're, we're raising the text complexity. We're trying to push higher and higher with this. A couple points I want to think about this quantitative information. In the past, uh, Lexile ended, uh, the recommendations for 12th grade ended around 1,200, which is not high enough to really do well in college. So the 1385, the new upper band, is designed to be the place that kids graduate ready for their college and career, ready to read those first-year college textbooks, ready to read technical documents, ready to be successful in their career. So that's not an arbitrary number, that 1385. That's really a, an expectation that kids are ready for where they go. Another thing I want to say back to the, or down to the other end, the K-1, the standards don't call for quantitative tools in kindergarten and first grade. <clears throat> and I think that's an important point. No one that I know is asking K-1 kids to read harder texts than they're already reading. We are asking teachers to do close reading where they read the text as its first access point uh, to kids. That the text that we read aloud to students in K-1 classrooms for close reading is way more complex than we've used in the past, and way more complex than letting students in on the process of sharing the thinking, going back and rereading, discussing, debating, asking questions. We're not really looking purely at quantitative measures in those grades because students are learning to read, and learning to read is hard work. But we are asking for teachers to read text aloud to kids for that close reading inspection. So this chart has been useful, as I've used it in PD sessions, to say, you know, yeah, this is where it used to be. You'll see where the overlap is, and you'll see where we have to stretch kids up that staircase. But it's not the only thing that we think about. <clears throat> What I'm interested in, uh, is there's a poll, uh, what do you think is, um, the teachers would say, contributes most to the qualitative text complexity? So Doug's going to launch the poll for you. And you can vote on one of those. And I'm watching the numbers jump all over the place as you vote. Oh, and levels of meaning are emerging as the leader. Well, language is taken, uh, coming back up. With 80% of the vote counted, I'm seeing level of meaning as, as a big, large um, 
contributor to what teachers would say um, it contributes to the complexity. And then language convention and clarity, followed by text structure, and last, knowledge demands, which kind of surprises me because I think a lot of teachers do say, oh, my students don't have the background knowledge for this. And these four phrases that you're seeing there are the way we think about qualitative text complexity in the Common Core. Those are the four things that we're talking about qualitatively that contribute to the text complexity. <clears throat> and that's where we have to get better. When a teacher, when an adult reader reads the text and says, what makes this text complex? Not just the quantitative values, but the qualitative measures, really saying, is it the density? Is it the figurative language? Is it the purpose? Does the author have a purpose? Does the author tell the purpose? That's level of meaning. In structure, it's like the organization, the genre, the narrator, the graphics and visual information. The formality of languages and language conventions. And then background prior cultural knowledge and vocabulary contribute to the knowledge demand. And I think we have gotten so much faster when we look at a piece of text to say, to know, this text is complex in these ways. And when we know that, we can plan instruction for students. We can plan to say, wow, look at this text. I have to teach X because this text is complex in that way. And in the past, I'm not sure we really did that much of this. I think we did a lot of comprehension strategy instruction irrespective of the factors of complexity, you know, no matter what we're going to predict or summarize or question or monitor or whatever. And now we're really thinking about what are the teaching points that we need? What do we need to do? To, what do we need to provide instruction in for students to really understand that text? So this is a really interesting bit of work. In fact, it's the starting place that we had in San Diego is really working on what made the text complex in the first place. And when we started doing that work and helping teachers really analyze the text, their selections increased. The, the text that they chose increased without ever asking to get kids into higher text. The factor of them learning how to analyze text influenced their selection of text. And that, the, the confusing part gets to be the difference between text complexity and text difficulty. And the way I think about it, text complexity lives in the text. It's part of the text. And you know, five different teachers could look at a piece of text, and, um, and they essentially come up with the fa same factors of the text complexity. Yeah, this text is complex because of the word choice, or this text is complex because of the role of the narrator. But that's the factor of complexity that exists inside the text. And then when applied to a specific group of students, those factors of complexity either become factors of difficulty or not. Let's say I found this beautiful, amazing piece of text about westward expansion, life in a wagon, first person narrative account. And, and I'm totally into this piece of text. And I really think about it. And I look at the factors of complexity. And there's a lot of background knowledge demands. There's a lot of prior knowledge. There's a lot of vocabulary. And there's a lot of language conventions that are difficult that are complex, that, are, that will, will trouble readers. If I use that piece of text in the very first week, the first couple days of the lesson, all of those factors of complexity are probably going to be factors of difficulty. If I use that exact same piece of text three weeks into a lesson, I suspect background knowledge, prior knowledge, and vocabulary would drop off and what I'm really faced with in terms of difficulty is the language conventions. And I think we haven't been thinking enough about that. So where are we placing the text? What do the students already know? What's their experience? What have they been taught? If narration is hard, like I was thinking about the book, um, the book thief recently about the narrator being deaf. If students have really explored the role of the narrator and narration and what it does, that shouldn't trip them up at all. Yes, it's a factor of complexity, but it's not a factor of difficulty. And that, that's the conversation we're having right now in our community is we got good at text complexity, but it doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be taught. It depends on what the students already know, what they've been taught, where we are in the unit, those kinds of things, how old they are, those kinds of things. We're getting way better at com 
comparing and contrasting text complexity with text difficulty. And then we have to plan a close reading lesson. So once we have our text, we understand what made the text complex in the first place, then we're ready to get started on planning a close reading lesson. And um, you know, it's, I've said this a lot, people write about this a lot, people talk about this a lot. Close readings are done with short passages. And I always get this, you know, how short kind of thing. And I just, I, I have a hard time answering that. My, I, uh, I gave a flip answer a couple of weeks ago. And I said, if there's a staple in the paper, it's probably too long for a close reading. And I kind of have stuck with that for the last couple of weeks. So you have a piece of paper, you can copy it on both sides. I'm good with that in a close reading. If it gets much beyond that, it's going to be hard for them to do close reading because they're going to get lost in it. So I, I don't know if that's a hard and fast rule, but I'm thinking about how long the text should be, um, and it should be short. The problem I'm seeing with this, as, I, as I've watched people really look at this over time, is that people are all, all seeming to choose standalone passages, you know, these perfect three paragraphs or these perfect five paragraphs. And that's all there is to the text. And I want to remind us that we can do close reading on strategic selections in longer text. We don't have to go find standalone text. I was working with our students here, and we were working on the metamorphosis. There are several places in that text that deserve close reading. And there are several places that they don't need to do close reading. They can read it collaboratively with each other. So we really need to get better at choosing short passages that allow students to go in more depth here. The second thing we look for is students rereading the text. And I think everyone has talked about that with close reading. It's multiple reads. What I don't think is that we can tell how many reads a given reader, given class, needs to do. I don't think it's as simple as saying, read one, everyone does this. Read two, everybody does this. Read three, everyone does this. And now they have perfect levels of understanding. I think that's way too simplistic. I think we cycle through the reads, and we push deeper. But there can be some pretty profound realizations after a single read, and then different things that happen in subsequent reads. Uh, Nancy and I have been doing a lot of work um, reading older and older um, documents um, around pe what people have tried. And you know, they back to uh, Mortimer Adler and Dan Curlin and different people saying, you know what, there are different phases of reading. And so this is our language. People have different language. When you first read the text in a close reading, you're really aiming for students understanding what the text says. And for me, that's the general understanding, kind of the big idea, and the key details. But if they can do that, if they've got the sense of the text, maybe it's flow, maybe it's organization, Maybe what happened in the beginning, middle, and end. Maybe retelling. Maybe the key idea or central idea um, and some detail. Then we're met, ready to move on to phase two. <clears throat> so I think about this like three scenarios. The teacher hands out the text. The students are marking the text. And their annotations and their margin notes are amazing and phenomenal and excellent. The teacher doesn't have to ask any questions. The students can go into the next phase. How does the text work? Second scenario, the teacher hands out the text, the margin notes are average, you know, not great. And then the um, teacher says, could you turn to your partner and um, with your partner, <coughs> sorry, with your partner, talk about the central idea in the text. And the teacher listens in on these partner conversations, and they're amazing. They're wonderful. We move on. Third scenario, the teacher hands out the text, the margin notes are average, OK, weak. The, student, the teachers ask the students to talk to each other. The conversations aren't very good. They're confused. They're mixing up things. Then you ask a series of detailed questions. We really are looking for more responsive teaching. When kids know what the text is saying, they have a sense of it. They can get the general ideas, some of the central themes or whatever. Then we're ready to move on. And then we move into how does the text work. And so if you're thinking about this, we're moving from literal to structural. We're moving from literally what is the text saying to you. And there can be some good understandings at the literal level. Um, and to instruct to structural level, structural, sorry, level. Things like vocabulary and text structure and author's craft. Some of those bigger things inside the text. 
that really push us into analyzing the moves of the author and the construction of the piece. And we can go back and forth. And if we don't understand something about the author's craft, we can go back to key detail and then come back to author's craft. And we're really looking for that second level, or, um, second phase, I guess, the deeper thinking. And later on, we move into the inferential level. What does the text mean? So we've gone from literal to structural to inferential. And some kids are going to go faster than others, but this process is really helping people plan close reading lessons and figure out the order of the questions. Like, how do I create the question order? And what am I looking for in terms of students' understanding? You know, what's the depth of knowledge that I can get to? And I don't want to be hard and fast and say, you must go here, and then you must go here, and this must go here. But I think phasing in some of the experience that kids have with, with text, with complex text, has really resulted in good things happening and the teacher not having to tell students what to think about the text. We want students to read with a pencil as part of this. And we used to say a lot about annotation, and I want to do some cautions on that. We started out, if you see our videos on YouTube, um, we see a lot of highlighters in our original work. We busted out all the highlighters, and kids are marking all over the text with highlighters. And they got so wrapped up in what color is this versus what color is that, and can I borrow your orange, and orange is only for question. It, they just got so wrapped up in it that it wasn't great for the text. Um, we also noticed that when we use highlighters, students don't like to mark the text on the initial read of the text because they know they've learned. They're probably not understanding it at a deep level. So, um, so they, we, we took away the highlighters and gave them pencils, and they started marking the text of the initial read so that um, the teacher could analyze um, the, their thinking from the first one. We also noticed that students don't um, tend to mark the text after about the second time they've read it because the close reading turns into a conversation. And, um, and they forget to mark the text. They forget to update their annotations. The problem with that is when they go to write from the source or when they go to debate or, or, or have a Socratic seminar, the markings are from their initial understanding of the text, and the evidence they use isn't as robust as it should be. So we really want to remind kids to update your annotations, you know, pause. I know you have this great partner or a group conversation. I'm going to give you a few minutes to update your annotations. So that's working way better now in the close reading process. And I put in, these are Mortimer Adler's ideas. These are the big ideas from Mortimer Adler about marking a text annotation. And this is what, this is what we work on um, in San Diego. These are our big ideas for annotation. And I think, um, we have to be careful of a lot of overkill. I'm seeing, you know, like 18 different annotation marks or 12 different annotation marks. And we don't need to do all of that. What we need to do is give kids some habits that they can use to mark the text on their own over time. And then text-dependent questions. As I said in the, in the rereading section, we really want to form questions that get students to go back in the text and look for evidence and make decisions and think. And that's the process of getting kids to reread, getting kids to provide evidence, to ask them questions that require evidence. And I don't mean just right there kinds of literal level questions. I think about the kinds of questions we ask that push students into different thinking. And I'm wondering what you all would say is the hardest part of that close reading. So there's a poll for you.
Interesting. With 82% of the vote, uh, we have text-dependent questions as, as the most difficult part, followed by annotation and rereading and finding the passage um, pretty low. Um, I would have said, if you would ask me a year and a half or two years ago, I would have said finding the passage was hard. Um, maybe I was naive, but it was really hard to figure out what was the right text for it. Um, that is not currently, after the long of implementation, that's not currently the struggle. Um, I find that once I've taught kids um, and practiced with them how to reread the text and do annotation, that happens pretty fast. But, I mean, the uptake happens pretty fast. Um, it's slow. I mean, that's not fair to say fast. Once they know how to do it, they tend to do it. It takes some time to develop that habit. But for me, the questions are taking time still. Is um, Am I asking the right question, the good question, an appropriate question, a question that, that, that encourages bigger thinking? And we all have different areas that are, that are a challenge for us as we implement this. What I do appreciate is we're getting a lot more consensus of what this kind of instruction is and is not, and when we should use it. Uh, and I, I think people are saying, we don't use close reading all day, every day. It's, it's strategic, like we do other things. Um, we, Nancy and I tried to collapse the standards, the nine reading standards, into six categories. And we said, when we analyzed them, we read them, we thought about them, we collapsed them, we said, here's how we think about the progression of questions that are based on the standards. The standards also have a whole bunch of instruction attached to them. In close reading, we're trying to release some of that responsibility and have kids try out things that they have been taught. So when I think about, when I think about this, um, we can ask them general understanding and key detail questions. Those are the kind of the base of the, of the, of the thinking around the text. So this is now about a year and a half old, this, this uh, figure here that you're looking at. And we're even collapsing it more. So we have nine standards six categories for questioning that we kind of said, here's how we're thinking about it. And now we're collapsing even further. That early on in the reading, we're working on the bottom two, general understanding and key details. And we just call that, what does the text say? And then we move into vocabulary, structure, author's craft, and purpose. And we call that, how does the text work? Or what's the structure of the text? And then we go back to standard one, what are the logical inferences, as well as what are the opinions and arguments you can make and form, and how does this text fit with other texts. Those last two, the top two categories, are what does the text mean? Um, and we hear people also talk about what does the text mean to me, and that's that personal connection and that critical literacy. But when we look specifically at the standards, we said nine standards, six categories, kind of three clusters or three phases. Um, and that's helping uh, us create better text-dependent questions that push the readers back into the text. I'm going to go through some examples of text-dependent questions, but I wondered if there are questions you want to ask me before, um, before I give you an example of the kinds of questions. So if you, if you want to ask a question, you can type it in the chat. I'll wait a second and see. Doug, we have had a few questions so far. OK. Um, so let me uh, uh, read a couple of them out for you. Um, one from Margaret asked, what Lexile ranges should K-1 teachers focus on? We understand that students should not be reading these, these texts independently but what ranges would be safe for K-1 teachers to focus on? So I think, um, when I've been thinking about this a lot, I think uh, for the K-1, we can go up pretty high because the students are listening to the text and talking about it. Um, I'll give you a couple examples. So I was in a first grade, a kindergarten classroom, I'll start with that example, a few weeks ago, and they were reading Winnie the Pooh. And Winnie the Pooh, uh, House on Pooh Corner, is a very complex text. I mean, you're, you're well into the fifth grade. And the teacher had read them chapter two, where Winnie the Pooh gets stuck in the hole in Rabbit's house. And they've got it, and they understood it. See, their listening comprehension is so much higher than their reading comprehension. And the teacher asked a series of text-dependent questions. 
talked about it, reread sections, why would Rabbit pretend not to be home. It was really interesting to get kids to go back into that text and do that. That was really powerful. I watched a first grade teacher read a book, happens to be my current favorite picture book, um, but I'm not allowed to endorse anything. Um, so it's called The Day the Crayons Quit. It's a series of letters from crayons to their owner. This is way harder than the first graders could read independently. And they were talking about why was red crayon upset? What was happening between yellow and orange crayon? They were doing amazing things. These are not the texts you would teach in small group intentional instruction, guided instruction, for them to learn to read on. We're trying to stretch their listening and thinking comprehension higher and higher and higher. That's what we want to do. So I'm, when I choose text, in the, when I'm working on that K-1 stuff, I'm usually choosing texts that are in the third grade, fourth grade range, but appropriate content for the K-1 classrooms. Um, so I, I think it's been really interesting to watch their thinking skills get stretched and their listening comprehension skills get stretched. What's the next question? Thanks, Doug. Um, the next one I've got here is, how often should we be engaging our students in close reading lessons? And you may have answered that a little bit uh, after our poll, but uh, if you want to revisit that, go ahead. Sure. Um, this is quite a debate. Um, in the middle school and high school, we're asking each teacher to do close reading two to three times a week. Um, because we know they have a lot of other stuff to do. There are labs to do and instruction and, and all kinds of stuff. So we're asking for two to three times a week. In the elementary school, we're asking teachers to do some close reading each day. It could be in science or social studies or language arts. It doesn't really matter to me where they put it as long as it's in complex text. Um, and I, and I, I think some people are trying to get clearer and clearer on how long it's going to take. One of my worries is, that if we do too much close reading, it will crowd out the instructional time that students need, because we still have to teach them things. Um, and I don't know the right answer. I think we probably will get clearer and clearer on that, especially as students participate in assessments of their knowledge and get a little bit better at understanding what, what it's going to take, what kinds of instruction, what kinds of practice it's going to take for students to get at that level. Thank you. Um, we've got a few more questions. Um, Jane asks, is close reading an appropriate strategy to be used in a middle school RTI classroom? Yes. In fact, uh, Nancy and I published in March an article with what the California State calls far below basic, kids with the, um, who very, very much struggle with reading from middle school. And we put them in a close reading intervention with more complex texts than their classrooms were using. And we had 100 kids in four schools um, start the intervention, and a comparison of about 350 kids. And the kids who did close reading as an intervention outperformed in significant ways the kids who got um, uh, traditional leveled instruction. And one of the big findings, yeah, their achievement went up on our state test, but one of the big findings, I think, was we use the reader self-perception scale. What do you think about yourself as a reader? In the beginning, the groups were the same. There was really no difference. They all thought they were bad readers. The kids who experience close reading of complex text start to think of themselves as better readers. So in part, because they're seeing themselves be successful with more complex text, and it's hard work, they start to tell themselves a different story, like, oh, I'm good at this. I can do this. So they build perseverance and stamina. And I think that was a huge finding. And I see kids in some of these remedial classes and remedial programs who don't think of themselves as very good readers. And so that's the story they tell to themselves, and they look for evidence that confirms that story. Um, so that was in the Journal of Adolescent and Adult Literacy for the middle school intervention from March. Great, thank you. Um, uh, no more questions for now. Um, we'll let you continue, and then we'll take a few more questions towards the end of your presentation.
Okay? So I thought we'd go into a little bit more depth around the categories of questions and, and look at some examples. Um, so we think about um, we think about looking at these general understanding, the kind of the overall view, the sequence, the arc of the story, kind of the main idea, the gist. What's the big important stuff? And the text I that I've chosen to use is the very hungry caterpillar. And it's a uh, really well-known text and primary grade text. And I think it's taught mostly as a here's what it, you know, we read it once, we perform it with a sock puppet. Kids totally know the story, but they do no work to think about the text per se. Um, so if I were to start that, and I've watched the revised lesson in nine classrooms in Chula Vista, if I were to watch it, I would start in a different place. Where I used to see the Hungry Caterpillar start was with uh, a personal connections question, and the kindergarten teacher would always ask the students, have you seen a caterpillar? And they would tell a series of random stories, you know, their encounters with caterpillars. They really had nothing to do with the text. And I think that was a waste of time. The idea was that if you ask these personal connection questions up front, that it would motivate the students to want to read the text. The problem is I don't think it worked. I think it, it was really unrelated to, to the work of reading the text and talking the text and thinking about the text. So I wouldn't ask that personal connection up, question up front. Now, I've been criticized for like avoiding front loading and avoiding pre-teaching vocabulary. And I want to clarify that in a close reading, I think we can get away with not doing a lot of front loading because of the process. We're going to reread again. We're going to go back to the text. We're going to look at text of any questions. We are using annotations. So I don't have to front end scaffold if I'm going to distribute my scaffold. So I would start with the general understanding question. I want you to retell the story in order using um, the words beginning, middle, and end. Um, that's where I'd start. If the students can't do that, they can't retell the story. I need to read the text to them again. Because that's a very basic part of this. Here are some things that happen in the beginning. Here's what happens in the middle. Here's what happens in the end. It's a sequence of events in this text. If they don't get that general understanding, I shouldn't tell them the answer. I should come back around. Then we move into these key detail questions, kind of what are the, the nuances and meaning, the important facts, the details that support those, who, what, where, when, why, how much, and how many. I get a little pushback from some administrators on this, that I'm encouraging teachers to ask literal questions. And I say, yes, exactly. I don't think in a complex text you can get to deep levels of understanding if you don't actually know what the text says. And I think that's been our problem. We haven't done a lot of, let's check in with kids and see if they actually understand what the text is saying before we push them into these deeper and deeper levels of text. So I might say, how long does it take to go from a hashtag to a butterfly? What's one food that gave them a stomach ache, one food that did not give them a stomach ache? And in those nine classrooms in Chula Vista, I watch these kids. They know where the information is. They want their teachers to reread parts. They want to talk about what they remember. They know this stuff. It took more than three weeks to go from a hashtag to a butterfly. He ate for a week, then he stayed inside for more than two weeks. They have to add the beginning of the text to later in the text. They know. Here are the foods that gave him a stomach ache, the foods that did not give him a stomach They know that. They want to think about it. They want to talk about it. In fact, in four of the classrooms, the te they wanted their teachers to write down on chart paper things that gave him a stomach ache and things that did not give him a stomach ache. They're very fun to watch them think through that text. That's not it, though. The text offers more. Now we can look at vocabulary. We can look at the structure, the sequence. There's a lot we can talk about with students. Maybe this is the next day. Maybe we've spent the 35, 40 minutes, whatever it is, just on that first phase, and now it's the next day. Maybe we're still continuing. Maybe the kids really got it fast and we're continuing. It's around being responsive to the student. So I might say, how does the author help us understand what cocoon means? I don't have to pre-teach cocoon if I'm going to come back around on the third reading and talk about it in more detail. Um, it says in the text, uh, he built a small house called a cocoon around himself. And then there's a full page illustration of a cocoon. And when I really have, I've heard this text, read this text hundreds of times. Um, and when I write, when I thought about a close reading, this sentence doesn't really make a lot of sense. I don't think it's a small house. Cocoon, I know, is the wrong word. And the science teachers in the middle school and high school freak out when we say this. 
it's not fair to tell the kindergartners that the author got the word wrong when they first read the text, because their brains are all about what's happening in the story or the text you're reading me. On the third read, I watched all nine of these classroom teachers say, the author said cocoon, but it's really chrysalis. So we can learn that word because we know. And then they talked about it. It's a shelter. He was in there doing what? He was changing. It was really an interesting conversation that kind of showed the depth of their thinking. We move into author's craft and purpose. What's the genre? What's the point of view? What's the literary devices? What are the poetic devices? Whose story is not being represented? What's the narrator? We start taking apart that internal part of the text. For example, who tells the story, the narrator, the caterpillar? That's an important question when you're five years old, to learn that there's a narrator. And what you think about the narrator can help you understand the text. If it's the caterpillar talking, it's a different genre than if it's a narrator talking. You can start to think about that. And the narrator tells the story because he uses the words he and his. If it was a caterpillar, he would say I and my. It's just a way of getting kids to go back in the text and look for evidence. Unfortunately, I still see sixth grade classrooms that are working on pronouns and point of view. And I've watched nine kindergarten classrooms in Chula Vista all be able to do this. I don't think it would be fair to have them do this on the first read. Their first read is really about what's going on in this text, what's happening here. But when they go back and analyze it, they're getting deeper and deeper and deeper into the text. Then we move back to inferences. That's back to standard one. What are the logical inferences we can make? And this one, fairly simple. The title of the book is The Very Hungry Caterpillar. Often the title is the main idea in these kinds of texts. But how do we know he's hungry? Do the details add up for us to make the logical inference that the title fits, that he's a very hungry caterpillar? And then we go back and analyze the text. And they want to read every single page. On Monday, he ate an apple, but he was still hungry. On Tuesday, he ate two pears, but he was still hungry. And so on and so on. And Saturday, he ate so much food, he got a stomach ache, and he was a big fat caterpillar. They're going back into the text, and they're looking for evidence. And the last part is to figure out what's your opinion or what's your argument, and how does this text fit with other texts. And that's really moving more deeply into what you understand about the text. And at the argument, opinion side, it could be as simple as saying, is this a happy story or a sad one? And how do you know? In nine kindergarten classrooms, the majority opinion is that it's a happy story. The evidence that they present, they produce, is that um, at the end of the book, there's a two-page spread, that he's colorful, he's beautiful, he can fly. They add evidence from that, that it's happy. In every one of the nine classrooms, there's been a dissenting opinion. And they'll say, no, it's a sad story. <clears throat> in all the cases, the sad story was the caterpillar didn't get to be the caterpillar anymore. And I think sitting in those rooms watching these five-year-olds five do this, they are thinking so deeply about a text. They are making a decision. <clears throat> they have an opinion. They can back that opinion up with evidence. That's what we're trying to accomplish here changing the nature of the discourse. They're using the text to make a decision and then back it up. They have ideas, they have thinking, they have evidence. And then we might read Monarch Butterfly and we might compare Monarch Butterfly to The Hungry Caterpillar. How are they alike and how are they different? That's what we're trying to get to, is going through this lesson, having kids do the cognitive work with the teacher providing the scaffold. Uh, I put up another example just to show a kindergarten up to high school. This is Eisenhower's message to the troops on June 6, 1944. Um, and it's all about this, you know, we're up, the enemy's strong, we're going to win, here's what's going on, I trust in you, I believe in you, we will accept nothing else, good luck. And there's this great primary source document from General Eisenhower and what he said, what he was his messaging to the troops. And you can have kids read that, and they can mark it, and they can look at it. And then the question, what words and phrases does Eisenhower use to inspire the troops on D-Day? And they go back in, and they're looking at word choice. They could ask, um, Eisenhower states that this invasion will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, eliminate tyranny, and create security th throughout the world. What does that tell us about him? Not what does the sentence mean. But how does that author's point of view help shape the content of the text itself? 
Ike's message to the troop acknowledges the difficulty of the mission, but assures them they will be triumphant. In what ways does he accomplish this? We're going to go back and look at some key details. How does the use of religious imagery change or contrast in the opening versus the closing? And they have these awesome conversations about this text. And we leave them and say, so what was Ike's state of mind on the night before the D-Day invasion? And they'll say, confident, assured, hopeful. They'll say all these words. And then we show them the in case of failure letter that's currently in the presidential archives. Um, and, and we can look at this on the same night, um, but dated incorrectly. Um, on the same night, wrote a letter that says we might fail. And if we fail, it's my, it's blame me. Blame me, not the soldiers who died trying. And they, the next day they read this, and we say, what's Ike's state of mind? And it's amazing to watch their level of thinking and understanding and comparison. That's what we're trying to accomplish here. Digging deeper into these texts. What do they mean? Why are they important? What, what happened here? We um, ask students to compare those texts because it helps them round out what was really going on. Then we talk about who's the audience for the text. And they get very clear. The first one is message to the troops. The audience is the troops. This one they talk about it's the American people. And then they realize it's the families of the soldiers who died, where the, where the, um, the general is taking blame. It, these are powerful lessons for kids to go deeper and deeper. And in the past, the history teacher probably told them all of this, but they didn't get to do the cognitive work of understanding it. That's what we're trying to do, is we're trying to get kids a chance to struggle to struggle and persevere and learn something through some inquiry with complex text. It's OK for students to struggle during close reading. In fact, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for grappling, cognitive engagement, some, some thinking about what does this text really mean. And that is what we're trying to accomplish with close reading. Close reading starts with the selection of a text. We have to develop some habits with students, like their annotation skills and their repeated reading skills. Text-dependent questions drive the close reading. It's how we scaffold for students. In fact, I used to think the questions were all about checking for understanding. Now I realize the questions are the primary scaffold in a close reading lesson. And it's OK if students struggle. We have to be OK with that as teachers, especially in the initial reads of the text. It's OK if they struggle. Um, Please ask me some more questions. I hope there are some more questions typed in there. Uh, we can also answer via email. Hi, Doug. Yes, we have a few more uh, questions that have come in. <clears throat> First one from Joanne. How does cold reading, air quotes on cold, and building background for ELLs play into close reading? Are these dichotomous? So, um, I think cold reading, what I, when I hear the phrase cold reading, it often is cold out loud reading, um, you know, reading something aloud for the first time you're encountering it, which I still think is a really bad idea. Um, I think kids deserve a chance to read the text and think about it before they would ever be asked to read it to a small group and talk about it. Um, but, and reading something cold doesn't mean there's not a purpose for it. I mean, so when we talk about close reading, we want students to encounter the text on that first read. But it's not the only read they're going to do. And I think that's been a mistake in the past. It's read it once, and then you have to do something afterwards. We're saying read it once, read it twice, read it three times, a fourth time, a fifth time. And it's about the purpose. What are we trying to accomplish? In a close reading, we're trying to avoid that front-loading, that pre-teaching, that telling kids the background. That doesn't mean if there's a really hard word, we don't tell them what the word is, and then you know give it to them. We just don't do 15 minutes of vocabulary in advance of the, of the close reading. Because close reading is only part of our instruction, we still do shared reading. We still do independent reading. We still do collaborative tasks. We're trying in a close reading to get kids to try on um, and apply the things we've been teaching them. And so we don't do a lot of front-loading or pre-teaching of vocabulary in a close reading because we know that the scaffolding, the the first read, the second read, the third read, is serving as that work for kids. OK, so I got another one here from uh, Gail. 
Do you see student conversations as an extension of close reading? If so, what parameters are conducive to get in-depth student talk? So I think um, uh, collaborative conversations is a key to close reading. If they're not talking about, if they can read the text and understand it by themselves, there's no reason to do close reading. Close reading is a peer-mediated uh, instructional approach. We got to get them to build some habits. And on our website, um, under the tab collaboration down towards the bottom, there are a lot of resources about teaching kids to learn to talk to each other. One's called the first 20 days, you know, 20 short lessons in the beginning of the school year to get kids to talk to each other. There have to be experiences, lessons, guidelines to get students to talk to each other. We have to build that with them. Um, it's not like they just show up and know how to talk to each other in academic ways. It's a lot of rehearsal and a lot of practice, and then they get really good at it. On our YouTube channel, which you can go to from our website, you'll see lots of examples of teachers getting kids to talk to each other about complex texts. And that's a big part of what we have to accomplish. That standard one in speaking and listening, the collaborative conversation standard, is really important. And I know a lot of districts have skipped over it in their implementation of Common Core, thinking, you know, We'll get to speaking and listening and language later. I don't know how to get kids into complex text if we don't get them talking so we can listen to their thinking. Thank you. Um, one quick question from Jenny. She was asking for the name of the article you referenced regarding the close reading uh, you completed with the middle school RTI students. Um, she didn't catch the whole name, so if you don't mind uh, uh, calling us the name of that again. Well, you know, it was in the Journal of Adolescent and Adult Literacy in March of this year, and I think it's um, close reading as an intervention for struggling middle school students. Um, if you let me look at my hard drive, I could tell you. Are you all looking at my hard drive now? We are. Um, we Excellent. can go ahead and follow up with Jenny separately. Uh, no big deal. Uh, we'll get her the name of that. Um, a question here from Crystal. How can middle school teachers make the, the close text experience more robust and engaging? The text itself, not the question. Um, well, I think it's all about text selection. You're picking things that are that are intriguing enough to get them to want to think about it and talk about it. What I love about close reading instruction is it's changing the the text that I select for my students to read, and that's what's really cool. That's really cool for me because the texts I'm choosing are are kind of out there, you know, they're, they're bigger ideas, it's things they want to know about. And I, now you're on the screen, you can see the article titled, Close Reading as an Intervention for Struggling Middle School Readers. Oh, don't do that. Cancel. Thank you. Um, question from Paul. Have you worked with students to generate uh, their own text-dependent questions? Yes, we have, and it, it's a great thing. Um, we teach them the categories, and we have them start, and we jump in when the conversation falters. It's hard, because they first have to learn what close reading is, but our new, next level is turning some of that over to kids. You know, in reality, when it's this really complex text, they don't think of all the levels of sophistication. It is a given now that students will talk about the general understanding and key details. They, we don't have to ask that question. They will talk about that because they know that's where we're going to start. They will start to take apart the words. They'll start to look at the structure. But until they get pretty good at this, they don't really think through the more complex, um, you know, the logical inferences and stuff like that. But I keep thinking about how different it is than last year and the year before and where we will be in two years. I mean, I'm amazed that these ninth graders that Nancy and I are working with automatically start their conversations around general understanding and key details. It's amazing to watch them. So what would they be like when they're juniors and that's what their experience is it? I mean, it's just incredible. Thank
Thank you. Um, one other quick question uh, from Jane. Is the webinar available in print for review? Yes, to that part of the question. And then for you, Doug, have you written any books specifically about close reading and the RTI student? Um, not about close reading and RTI, no. The only thing we've written about kids who, um, who are on the high, high struggle is the article. We've written close reading books, um, but not specifically about uh, students that are at the RTI level. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, well, thank you all. If there's any other questions, feel free to type them in now. We're just going to kind of wrap up. Um, <clears throat> we want to thank you guys for attending and spending time with us today. We're going to be sending a follow-up email, um, as I chatted to most of you, um, uh, with the link to the recording and also uh, a PDF of the presentation. So if there's any examples or anything you want to pull from there, feel free. Um, also, as you access the webinar today, we have a survey that's going to pop up, and we would appreciate your feedback. Um, so just take a moment and uh, take that survey as you exit. And then if we didn't get to your question today or for Jenny, we're going to get you a copy of that article. Um, we'll follow up with you individually after the webinar. Um, and of course, if you have any questions or need to contact us about anything, our email address is webinars at mheducation.com. So thank you again, everybody. Thank, thank you. you, Doug.